Okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, Alright, so this is uh, our uh, next subtopic related to chapter 3, Transport and Circulation. So our next LO will be cover the uh, human lymphatic system and uh, the function. Okay, right. So what is lymphatic system? So lymphatic system is one of uh, another type of uh, circulatory system that uh, vertebrate, including human, has. Okay, lymphatic system is a kind of uh, circulatory system which has different function um, uh, what, uh, as compared to uh, the blood circulatory system. But somehow, lymphatic system and blood circulatory system do connect uh, each other. Okay, right. Okay, lymphatic system. So the lymphatic system consists of lymphatic vessels, right? The function is to conduct limb. Limb is um, the fluid inside the lymphatic system. In blood circulatory system, we call it as blood. But for lymphatic system, the fluid that is transported along the uh, lymphatic system, we call it as limb. Okay. So which one is the lymphatic vessel? So you can see these are all the lymphatic vessels. All right. Okay. Next one. Limb nodes and limb organs. So limb nodes and limb organ. So what are limb nodes? So limb node is a small mass, small masses of limb tissue. It contain uh, phagocytes the, where the function of the phagocyte in the, uh, in the limb node is to filter out bacteria and other harmful material. So which one are those, the limb nodes? So these are all the limb nodes, the small patches that you can see over here, right? Uh, and uh, so in bigger picture, uh, so this is the limb nodes, right? So it contain phagocytes to uh, filter out uh, any uh, bacteria or pathogen or any harmful material. Okay, as for limb organ, so we have few limb organ in the lymphatic system, including the spleen. This is the spleen, right? Uh, the thymus, so this is thymus. All right, tonsil. Okay, pious patches, right here on the small intestine, right? And also appendix. All right, so in the bigger picture, oh, okay, you can see this. All right, so that is limb nodes and also lymphatic vessel. Uh, sorry, limb nodes and also uh, limb organ or lymphoid organ. Okay, and what is pious patches? So pious patches is group of limb nodes that forming a single layer in the membrane of the ileum in the small intestine. Okay, right. So madam, what if I have removed my tonsils and also my appendix? Does it will affect my uh, lymphatic system? Uh, so inshallah, it will not give a very a huge effect to your, um, what you call it, to your health and, or your, uh, and also to your immune system because there are a lot more of uh, the lymphatic uh, organs that can uh, actually support the immune system and the function of lymphatic system, okay? All right, so this is the bigger picture of the lymph vessel, lymphatic vessel, and this is the lymph nodes. All right, so you can see that the lymphatic vessel is uh, somehow very close, right, to our blood vessel, right? And this is where it actually can uh, having, what we call it, uh, function that related to one another, okay? All right. So uh, let's see here what happened, right, in the how uh, lymphatic vessel, oh, sorry, how lymphatic system is working in our body. So first of all, remember, in between of our cells, right, they are fluid. So this is what we call as interstitial fluid. So interstitial fluid bathing the surrounding tissue along with the white blood cell in it. And sometimes it will be continually enter the lymphatic vessel accidentally, all right? Why is this happen? That is due to different in terms of pressure. So somehow the pressure inside the interstitial fluid is slightly higher compared to the pressure inside the lymphatic vessel and causing some of the lymphatic, uh, sorry, some of the interstitial fluid to be uh, entering or diffuse into the lymphatic vessel. So once the uh, interstitial fluid enters the lymphatic vessel, then the fluid will be known as limb. Okay, fluid inside the lymphatic vessel is called as limb. 
it flows through the lymphatic vessel throughout the body and then reaching to lymph nodes. All right, so you just imagine uh, the lymph travel along the lymphatic vessel and then reach to the lymph nodes. So within the lymph nodes, pathogen and foreign particle in the circulate, that circulating uh, lymph encounters and activate macrophage, right? And other cell that will carry out defensive action. For example, so this, uh, what I call it, uh, phagocytes, example, macrophage can engulf the pathogen or bacteria via phagocytosis. Okay, right. So this is the mass of the lymph node containing um, phagocytes. Okay, right. And then what happened? Okay, after uh, the lymph fluid is filtered in the lymph nodes, so the lymph fluid will then continue uh, travel along the lymphatic vessel and return to the blood circulatory system via two large ducts that drain into the vein near the shoulder. So next what happened, the fluid then will continue to travel along and then return back to the our blood circulatory system via these two large ducts near the shoulder. All right, uh, so that is how lymph fluid can be returned back to our blood circulatory system. Okay, right. Okay, so this is the detailed process uh, on the flow of uh, lymphatic uh, fluid or lymph along the lymphatic vessel. Okay, right. So you can see uh, what is lymph. Again, lymph is a very clear watery fluid that derives from the interstitial fluid. Okay, so we have here is arteriole, small branch of artery, where it will be sub branches into uh, numerous uh, blood capillaries, all right? And then you can see this is the interstitial fluid, interstitial fluid. So the pressure of blood capillary, right, is higher than the interstitial fluid. So some fluid from the blood capillary will diffuse or will enter into the uh, interstitial fluid. And the pressure inside the interstitial fluid is higher than the pressure inside the lymph capillaries. So that makes the lymph, uh, sorry, the interstitial fluid then enter into the, then enter into the lymph capillary. All right? Sorry, sorry. So from here, okay. From the interstitial fluid, then it enters the lymph capillary, right? So in the lymph capillary, then it will be known as lymph. Uh, so this is arteriole, this is uh, venue. Okay, so this is our uh, lymph capillary or lymph vessel. Okay, so from the lymph capillary, then the lymph fluid will then travel along in the lymph vein and then to the lymph nodes where the lymph fluid will be filtered, okay? And then uh, it will be sent into a larger vessel, which is lymph duct. And then the fluid will be emptied back into blood circulatory system via thoracic vein. Okay, right. Sorry. Uh, it will be, uh, what do you call it? Uh, the lymph uh, will travel into the lymph duct, right? And then empty it back into the or transfer back or transported back into the blood circulatory system via subclavian vein near the shoulder. Okay, right. Okay, so you can see from here. So this is what happened. Uh, the okay, so you can see some of the blood component diffuse into the interstitial fluid. And from the interstitial fluid, then the fluid, interstitial fluid diffuse into the limb capillary. Then it, it is known as limb. Okay. All right. And this is video uh, detailed explanation about the lymphatic system. The lymphatic system helps our bodies get rid of toxins, waste, and other unwanted materials, including infections and cancer cells. It is a system of thin tubes called lymph vessels and lymph nodes, 
or glands. These run throughout the body. The spleen, thymus, tonsils and adenoids are also part of the lymphatic system. Along the lymph vessels are small bean-shaped lymph glands. You might be able to feel these in your neck, under your arm and in your groin, but they are also throughout the body, including the chest, abdomen and pelvis. The lymphatic system carries a colourless liquid called lymph. As the blood circulates around the body, fluid passes from the blood into the body tissues, carrying food to the cells. This fluid bathes the tissues to form tissue fluid, which collects waste products, bacteria, damaged cells and cancer cells if there are any. The fluid then drains back into the lymph vessels where it is transported towards the lymph glands. The glands then filter the lymph, taking out any harmful products. The lymph also contains lots of white blood cells, called lymphocytes, which help us fight infections. The lymph eventually reaches a large vessel at the base of the neck, called the thoracic duct, which passes the filtered lymph back into the blood circulation. If the lymph vessels or nodes are blocked, removed or damaged, it can cause a buildup of fluid. This can cause swelling, known as lymphedema. For more information about lymphedema and cancers of the lymphatic system, go to cruk.org slash cancer hyphen types. Okay. All right. So you can see that from the, uh, what? From the uh, lymph vessel, then the lymph fluid will be traveled to the uh, thoracic duct and drained back into the blood circulatory system via subclavian vein. Okay. So you can see from this picture, lymph capillary join and merge to form larger lymphatic veins. The lymphatic veins empty the lymph into the subclavian. Uh, lymphatic vein empty uh, into subclavian vein via thoracic duct and the lymphatic duct. So you can see the fluid will travel okay, to the right lymphatic duct and to the thoracic duct where the lymph fluid will be emptied back into the blood circulatory system via subclavian vein near the shoulder. Right subclavian and also left subclavian vein. Okay, right. Okay, so next is, okay, right? This is picture that showing you uh, the lymphatic vessel is actually very close together with the blood circulatory system or blood vessels. And that is how they are connected in terms of function, right? To filter the blood, right? Help in maintaining the body fluids uh, and so on. Okay, right. So one um, important thing that we should understand is the lymphatic vessel do have lymphatic valve, right? So what is the function of this valve? Okay, so you can see the movement of limb in mammal happen in one direction, right? So the movement, what makes the lymph fluid move uh, in one direction, it is assisted by different in terms of pressure, as we discussed earlier, pressure in the uh, interstitial fluid is higher than the pressure inside the lymphatic capillary, uh, the pressure inside the lymphatic capillary is higher than the lymphatic vessel and so on, okay? Number two is the pulsation of vessel wall, so remember, our blood vessel is quite elastic, so it is keep on um, slowly contracting, right? Next is due to the contraction of skeletal muscle. So contraction of skeletal muscle assists the movement of limb uh, in our uh, circulatory system as well. And valve in the lymphatic vessel prevent the backflow of fluid towards the capillary. So the presence of the valve will actually prevent the lymph fluid from flowing back into the capi capillary. Okay, right. Okay, what are the function of lymphatic system? Okay, the first one is to return interstitial fluid to the circulatory system. So in this case, you can see from the video itself, in, uh, lymphatic system is actually help to filter uh, the component in the interstitial fluid. If let's say it contain bacteria and whatnot, right? So it can return the clean interstitial fluid back to the circulatory system, okay? Number two, lymphatic system is help in immunity where it has a macrophage, right? Or phagocytes that will actually help to um, engulf, right? Uh, foreign material in the lymph 
fluid. And number three, lymphatic system help to absorb lipid from the gastrointestinal tract. Okay. Okay, so you can see here, this is the um, network of uh, capillary, right? And this is lacteal. Okay, so that lacteal help in terms of uh, absorption of um, lipid in the gastrointestinal tract. Okay, so you can see that uh, here is the uh, intestine, right? Cross section of intestine. So there are blood capillary uh, surrounding the intestine to absorb nutrient. And then there is specialized uh, limb capillary that we call as lacteal, right? In the center of each of the villus. So the blood capillary absorb most of the nutrients, but uh, fat soluble vitamins um, will be absorbed by the lacteal. Okay, so this is a function of a uh, part of uh, lymphatic system uh, function in absorption of nutrient, especially lipid. Okay. All right. Okay, next. All right. So what are the comparison or differences between blood circulatory system and lymphatic system? So both um, blood circulatory system and lymphatic system are closed circulatory system, right? So... Uh, blood circulatory system has pump, which we refer to the heart as pump, whereby there is no pump in lymphatic system. So the movement of uh, blood in blood circulatory system is depending on the action of heart pumping, right? And sometimes it also depends on external pressure in the vein, right? And the difference in terms of pressure in different vessels. But for lymphatic system, the, the movement of lymph fluid within the lymphatic system is depending on external pressure, all right? And generally, external pressure like skeletal muscle contraction. And generally, the pressure is lower, okay? Right, next, a valve in the vessel. For blood circulatory system, uh, there is uh, or there are vessels uh, in the uh, blood vessel that leading towards the heart, right? Uh, which is vein. And also there's a valve that can be found in pulmonary artery and iota. But lymphatic system has um, valve in most of the lymphatic vessels, okay? And then fluid in the blood circulatory system we call as blood and uh, fluid in the lymphatic system we call as lymph, right? And in terms of function, uh, blood circulatory system has various function, uh, which we have discussed earlier. Right, which mainly to transport, transport gases, transport nutrient, to transport waste, to transport hormone, right? Uh, balance, uh, uh, help in the balance of fluid, okay? Whereby uh, lymphatic system is basically uh, important for absorption of fat, right? Uh, okay, through lacteal, and then return interstitial fluid back into the blood circulatory system, right? And also filter and foreign. Uh, filter and destroy foreign particles. Okay, so these are the uh, comparison between uh, blood circulatory system and lymphatic system. Okay, so we have finished with the transport and circulation in a uh, human. Okay, so now we are moving into plants, right? So these are LOs for plant where you have to describe the lateral, lateral and upward uptake of water and mineral through xylem, okay? And then uh, you have to learn on how um, flower transport sugar via mass flow hypo hypothesis, okay? So these are the LO related to plant uh, transport and circulation. Okay, transportation in plants. Okay, so plant transport water and solute and it involves short distance transport, and also long distance transport. So what are the difference between this short distance transport and long distance transport? Okay, right. So we start with short distance transport. Okay, short distance transport is the movement of water and solute from cell to cell, from cell to cell, right? Within a plant tissue or within organ. So this is what we call as lateral transport. So transportation uh, apa nama, uh, within one cell to another cell, right? Or uh, from one uh, tissue to another tissue, this is what we call as short distance 
transport. Okay, right. Whereby Okay, and usually this kind of short distance transport uh, happen along the radial axis of a plant organ. Okay, right. So lateral transport uh, of water and mineral started from the soil. Okay. All right, started from the soil. So let's say this is soil. The soil contain water and also mineral. Right, so the water and mineral from the roots uh, from the soil will be absorbed by the root epidermis of the root hair. Okay, and then from there, the water and mineral will be then transported into the cortex. So, this is root hair, and then from the root hair, it is absorbed into the root epidermis. So, this is root epidermis. Right, so from the root epidemies, then water will be absorbed or transported into the cortex tissue. So this is cortex tissue. So from cortex, then it will uh, be transported into the endodermis tissue. All right, before reaching to the vascular tissue. Remember, this is the structure of vascular tissue in the root where you have center cylindrical vascular cylinder, right? Okay, so this is the pathway that you have to memorize related to the, uh, what you call it, uh, transportation of water and mineral in short distance transport. Okay, so from the soil, then into the root epidermis, uh, cortex, endodermis, and then vascular tissue. Okay, so there are three available routes for the lateral transport of water and mineral, right? They are transmembrane root, uh, symplastic, and also apoplastic root. Okay, right? Transmembrane, symplastic, and apoplastic. Okay, now you might be seeing this in this picture. They are somehow you can see that this arrow showing you a different kind of pathway compared to this arrow, right? So this is explained on how the root of water and mineral, uh, which would be different either transmembrane, symplastic, or apoplastic. Okay, so what is transmembrane root? Okay, transmembrane root is uh, referring to the repeated crossing of plasma membrane and cell wall. Solutes, or maybe refer to minerals. Okay, right, solutes, uh, about water and mineral can exit one cell and enters to the next cell. Maksudnya, repeated crossing between plasma membrane, cell wall. So meaning the water and mineral is just um, travel or uh, transported along the plasma membrane, cell wall. Plasma membrane, cell wall. From one tissue to another tissue until reaching to the vascular tissue, which is into the xylem. Okay, let's see this one. Okay, so this is transmembrane root. So transmembrane root is repeated crossing between plasma membrane All right, then cell wall. All right, uh, so you can see repeated crossing between plasma membrane, cell wall, and so on. So that is transmembrane root. Okay, so what about the second one, symplastic root? Okay, symplastic root is the pathway of solutes, okay, and water within continuum of cytosol. Within continuum of cytosol mean within the component of the cytosol. Thus, it requires only minimum crossing or minimum one crossing of plasma membrane sahaja. Meaning they just need to at least cross one plasma membrane. And after that, the solutes or and water just need to cross or uh, uh, move along the continuum of the cytosol between one cell to another cell, All right? So water move from cell to cell 
in the continuum of cytosol going to the next cell via plasmodes mata. Okay, right. So let's see this one. Okay, so this is same plastic root, the blue color. So you just imagine if let's say I draw this complete cell. So you will have actually um, crossing of at least one plasma membrane, crossing of one plasma membrane, right? Then water travel or move along the, uh, from one cell to another cell along the continuum of cytosol and going to the next cell via plasmodes mata. Okay, all right, so that is same plastic root. Okay, what about uh, apoplastic root? Okay, apoplastic root is the pathway that consisting of cell wall and extracellular space of the cell wall without entering the protoplast or no crossing of plasma membrane. So meaning to say water and solute only move along the cells from one cell to another cell, from one tissue to another tissue, right? Along the cell wall and the component of extracellular space of the cell wall without crossing the plasma membrane, okay? So you can see here, right, apoplast, the, uh, the green color, uh, sorry, the pink color, right, the pink color. So you can see that water and uh, mineral or solute travel along the cell wall and the extracellular space of the cell wall without uh, crossing the plasma membrane, okay? Right, so look at this animation down here. All right, so you can see the blue color over here is apoplastic root. So what, and the green color is a uh, same plastic root where water uh, and mineral move along the um, continuum of the cytosol with minimum of one cruising of plasma membrane. Whereby the blue color, you can see that water and mineral is just travel along uh, the cells, all right, uh, through the cell wall and uh, with the extra component, extra cellular component of the cell wall, ataupun extra cellular space of the cell wall without crossing plasma membrane, okay? All right, okay, that is the three possible Root. So make sure you can understand if given to you a picture of root, make sure you can identify and explain what are those particular roots. Okay, right. So again, uh, you can have this picture in page 847, right? You can see that this picture showing you apoplastic root and also symplastic root, right? So symplastic root, you can see it cross minimum one plasma membrane over here. And then the water and mineral move along the continuum of the cell wall from one cell to another cell via plasmodes mata until reaching to the vascular tissue, which is the xylem. Okay. But, uh, and you can see also here, apoplastic root. So water and mineral move along the cell wall. Okay. And uh, in with the component, extracellular component of the cell wall with, without crossing the plasma membrane. Okay, and this one uh, showing you transmembrane root, where transmembrane root is, uh, can be switching between uh, symplastic and apoplastic root, where it, it cross uh, the plasma membrane and cell wall. But you have to notice something over here. Uh, as the water and mineral reach to the endodermis layer, did you notice that the apoplastic root is somehow then switch or exit the apoplastic root and then enters symplastic root. Nampak tak kat situ? Okay, let me just erase, right? So this is still crossing the cell wall. But as it reach to the endodermis layer, so the apoplastic root, water and mineral will exit the apoplastic root and then enters the symplastic root. Why is that happen? Right, okay, another bigger picture over here. This is pathway along apoplastic root as it reaches to the endodermis layer. 
you can see that upper plastic road exit, okay, water and mineral exit the upper plastic road and then enters the same plastic road. Okay, why is that happen? Why is the, the water and mineral cannot just continue crossing the uh, cell wall and the extracellular space of the cell wall? Okay, that is due to the special features of the endodermal cell. Okay, all right. Endodermal cell and also living cell within the vascular cylinder discharge water and mineral into their wall via apoplastic pathway. The xylem vessel then transport water and mineral by bulk transport upward into the shoot system. So this statement saying that endodermal cell, right, later on will discharge the water into the uh, vascular cylinder. And from the vascular cylinder, the xylem vessel then will transport water in a bulk transport upward into the shoot system. All right, okay. So mula-mula, air daripada akar, right, transported into root epidermis, cortex, all right, uh, endodermis, and then reaching to the vascular cylinder. So as it reach, the water in there reach the vascular cylinder, then the water will be transported upward. Okay, right. Okay, so what is happened uh, to the uh, upper plastic root of water and mineral as it reached to the endodermis layer. Okay, so that is because the presence of Casparian strip. Okay, you can see here Casparian strip is located within endodermis layer or endodermis cell. So this is Casparian strip. Right, so Casparian strip is a belt of suberin which is sifat dia, dia waxy. So as it is waxy, meaning that it is impervious to water and dissolved mineral. Dia tidak telap kepada air dan juga mineral. So nak tak nak, maksudnya air dan mineral tak boleh lalu dekat kawasan yang ada Casparian Street. That is why up water and mineral that using, simple, sorry, water and mineral that using apoplastic root will have to exit the apoplastic root and then enters the same plastic root, meaning they must cross the plasma membrane because plasma membrane is selective permeable. Okay, so kena lalu juga plasma membrane. So plasma membrane can select whatever minerals that can enter the vascular cylinder. Okay, right. Okay, how to understand? Okay, you just imagine this um, particular pen drive. This is one of the endodermis cell. Okay, so you just imagine all right, uh, around the, uh, this pen drive or around this uh, endodermis cell is the Casparian strip, All right? So meaning to say you cannot uh, pass through the wall unless you cross the plasma membrane, okay? All right, so why is the importance of Casparian strip? So Casparian strip ensures water and mineral moving through apoplast must cross selectively permeable plasma membrane of the endodermal cell before entering the vascular cylinder. So as it, um, what we call it, um, uh, cross the selective permeable plasma membrane, so it will ensure that the uh, only needed minerals from the soil that can be transported into the xylem, okay? So it also can keep many unneeded or toxic substances out of the uh, plant. Okay, right. And it also will prevent the ions from leaking back into the cortex and soil. Okay, you just imagine water and mineral has already entered the vascular cylinder or vascular tissue. So the, the presence of Casparian strip will avoid the mineral or ions that contain inside the vascular cylinder from flowing back into the cortex, for example, okay, right. So these are function of Casparian strip. Okay, so you can see this is, <clears throat> okay, so you can see uh, this is the uh, endodermal cell. Okay, these are all the uh, short distance transport or the root of water starting from the root epidermis and then into the cortex as it reached to the endodermis cell. Then you have here a waxy or waxy belt. 
that we call as Caspian strip, right? And then um, you can see here apoplastic pathway need to be uh, what we call it switch or exit the apoplastic pathway and cross the plasma membrane. Okay. <coughs> Before entering the vascular tissue or vascular cylinder. Okay. Right. Okay. Next, long distance transport. Okay. So that is short distance transport, meaning to say you are transporting water from the soil, right, into the vascular cylinder, meaning the water and mineral is transported from one cell to another cell or from one tissue to another tissue until reaching to the vascular cylinder. So that is short distance transport. So long distance transport is referred to how water can be transported upward up to the chute. So that is the long distance transport related to the transportation of water and mineral in the xylem. Okay, right. Long distance transport involve transportation of water, right? And long distance transport in flowworm refer to the transportation of sucrose. Okay, so transport of water involve root pressure. So this is the long distance transport in related to transportation of water. It involve root pressure and also transpirational pool or transpiration cohesion tension mecha mechanism, right? As for transport of sucrose in the phloem, it is referred to mass flow or pressure flow or bulk flow hypo hypothesis. Okay, so these are the long distance transport. Okay, so we will cover the first part, which is the long distance transport of water, right, involving Root pressure and transpirational pool. Okay, so root pressure. So root pressure, water that move into the root from the soil is pushed up through the xylem towards the top of plant. Water that move into the root from the soil is pushed up through the xylem towards the top of the plant. Okay, this is occur because minerals ion that are actively absorbed from the soil are pumped into the xylem and thus decreasing the water potential. Okay, let's say we have here root, okay, root epidemies, let's say, and then, uh, so, and then this is cortex, okay, this is root epidemies, this is cortex, this is endodermis that have Casparian strip, and here is our vascular cylinder, okay, for example. Okay, so this is our vascular. Okay, so what happened is, okay, first, right, so this is the soil. Okay, first is the transportation of mineral. Mineral ions, so you have here ions, okay, Mineral ions that are actively absorbed from the root are pumped into the xylem. So ions will be pumped from into the root epidermis and then to the cortex and then to the endodermis and then into the vascular tissue or into the xylem, right? So we have high concentration of ions here inside the vascular tissue, right? So the pumping, or the transportation of ion actively all right, from the soil into the uh, xylem will decrease the water potential inside the xylem. So high concentration of ion, so lower the water potential inside the xylem. Okay, so accumulation of ion will cause the water to move into the xylem from the surrounding root cell. So when there is low water potential inside the xylem, so water from the root, okay, root cell will be absorbed by osmosis. And that is how water is transported from the uh, soil into the root vascular tissue. Okay, so water move into the root cell by osmosis due to the difference in the water potential between the soil and also the root cell. So water potential in the soil of our high uh, water potential 
of uh, uh, apa nama in the root sorry in the soil is higher compared to the water potential in the root epidermis so then water enter the epidermis so samalah uh, water potential in the epidermis is higher than the cortex blah 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 and that what makes water continually um, absorb from the soil into the root and then into the xylem right following the water potential Okay, right. Okay, so the accumulation of water in the root tissue, okay, remember water is keep on pumping from the soil into the root. Again, why? Because water potential of the, uh, what we call it, of the root tissue is lower or water potential of the xylem uh, or xylem or vascular cylinder in the root is lower compared to the water potential in the soil. So that what makes water diffused by osmosis from the soil into the root cell or root tissue and then la 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 into the root xylem. Okay, accumulation of water in the root tissue produce positive pressure. So what does positive pressure means? Positive pressure can be understood as push, right? Because you have, you have to remember xylem has a very high minerals, so lower water potential. Soil have higher water potential. So water from the soil will diffuse into the xylem. So water will be keep on transported into the xylem from the soil. So this is what we call as positive pressure or root pressure, right? So this root pressure or positive pressure forces water up through the root xylem into the shoot. But the root pressure is a minor mechanism to force water up. The most able that it can able to push water is only a few meters up sahaja. Maknanya, okay, look at my hand. Okay, let's say this is my uh, level of water potential. Okay, this is level of water potential, right? So you can see here, uh, how to make this, okay. So this is a level of water potential, right? And this is root. So you can see that water from the root is keep on being uh, pumped or transported into the xylem via root pressure. What happened to the water level? Water level increased a few meters up. All right. Uh, so root pressure can actually force uh, or forces the water up through the xylem, but in a, just a few meters up. Uh, Okay, but what makes water can be pulled upward, okay, up to 100 meter height, right, uh, of plants. So that is due to another concept, which is transpirational pool. Okay, so meaning to say, kalau untuk pokok yang renek-renek -renek, dalam hutan, you boleh nampak the effect of root pressure, where you can see uh, uh, what we call it droplet at the edge of the leaves that we call as gutation atau kita panggil sebagai embun right uh, so uh, apa embun ke ah yeah embun okay gutation right so a uh, droplet of water that can be see at the edge of the leaves which you can actually drink the water from the leaf because it is very very clean that is the effect of root pressure but it can just be seen for uh, short plants right for tall plant Right, uh, water can be pulled upward due to transpirational pool. Okay, after sunrise, transpirational pool provide major force that cause the water to flow upwards. Okay, right. Okay, so this is what I mean by gutation. So gutation is phenomenon in which liquid water is forced out through special opening in the leaves. So it is occur because more water enter the leaves right, then that is transpired. And so usually this can be seen uh, at the night time or early uh, dawn, okay, right. So this is uh, the effect of root pressure. Okay, now let's see cohesion tension hypothesis or what we call as transpirational pool. Okay, water is pulled up uh, the plant as a result of tension that is produced at the top of the plant. Tension that is produced at the top of the plant. Okay, what does, uh, how does this tension produce? 
The tension is produced because of the evaporative pool of transp transpiration. So tension is a negative pressure. Okay, so to understand negative pressure, you understand it as cooling pressure. Root pressure create positive pressure. Positive pressure is a push pressure, right? Uh, transpirational pool create negative pressure. So negative pressure is a pulling force. Daya mena menarik. Okay, tension is a negative pressure at the surface of the leaves. Okay, on top of the plant. Okay, now let me draw. Okay, let's say we have here root. Okay, and then we have uh, stem. Okay, and top here we have leaves. As example. Okay, so in bright sunny day, right? Remember the water droplet, right? Uh, on the surface of the leaves will be transpired or evaporated. So as water evaporated from the surface of leaf, it will cause the water potential on the leaf surface is lower. This will create tension. So the water potential on the leaf surface is lower compared to the water potential inside the root, for example. Water potential in the root is higher compared to the water potential on the leaf surface. So this will cause water to be pulled upward from the high water potential in the root to the low water potential in the leaves or up to the shoot. This is make water able to be pulled upward from the root to the shoot. Okay, right. Okay, so you can see this explanation in textbook, page 750. So water vapor transpired from the surface of mesophyll cell of the leaf, right? So the transpiration produced tension, right? Uh, so because low water potential here at the leaf surface, okay? So cohesion of water molecules. So remember water have this characteristic, adhesion and also cohesion. So cohesion, among the water molecule caused by the hydrogen bond, allow the unbroken column of water to be pulled up to the narrow vessel of the truckets of the stem. Okay, right. So this cohesion in, term, in turn, pull the water up the root xylem, forming a continuous column of water from the root to the shoot. So this is what we call as creating the um, negative pressure. Okay, right. Addition of water molecule with the wall of the xylem also by hydrogen bond helped uh, to, uh, what we call it, to help the offset of downward or against the force of gravity. So it will ensure that the water will be pulled upward continuously. So the concept here is because of the um, different in terms of prey, Pressure, low water pressure, uh, water potential, okay, in the uh, leaves and high water potential in the root. Okay, so this factor happened due to the process of transpiration. And that's why the mechanism is known as transpirational pool or cohesion tension mechanism. Okay, because it's somehow related to the characteristic of water cohesion tension mechanism. Okay. All right, so again, you can see uh, this is what happened uh, on the leaf uh, wall where the pressure is uh, very, very high. Okay, negative one uh, MPA compared to the water potential inside the soil or inside the root xylem. Okay, this is what makes water to be pulled upward from high water potential to low water potential. Right, okay. Okay, so that is about the process of uh, transpirational pool and also root pressure that involved in the transportation of water and mineral in the xylem. All right, okay. So next we are moving into the phloem and translocation. All right, so translocation of organic nutrient occurs within the sieve tube of the phloem. Remember, 
the uh, phloem is the complex tissue comprises of sieve tube and also companion cell. Okay, sieve plates, right, allow sap to flow from one sieve tube to another sieve tube. Remember, this is one sieve tube and it is connected to another sieve tube. So one sieve tube to another sieve tube is connected via sieve plate. So the sap, phloem sap, phloem sap here referring to the component inside uh, or that is transported by the phloem, which refers to the sucrose, minerals, amino acid or hormone. So this is all what we call as phloem sap. So sap can travel along from one sieve tube to another sieve tube via sieve plate. Okay, direction of phloem sap travel can be vary, but always from sugar source to sugar sin. Maknanya, gula or uh, these uh, minerals, a eh, mineral, uh, sugar or solutes that transported within the phloem must be always transport from the sugar source and sugar sin. But the, the direction would be different. What is sugar source? Okay, right. So sugar source is the plant organ that produce or we call as the net producer of sugar. Di mana sugar dihasilkan, kita panggil sebagai sugar source. It can be, uh, for example, the leaf. The leaf is the sugar source, right? Uh, that resulted from photosynthesis. And what is sugar sink? Right? So sugar sink is organ that is the net consumer. Maksudnya bahagian tumbuhan yang menjadi pengguna kepada gula tu ataupun gula tu akan dihantar ke mana that is what we call as sugar sink. Example, storage sugar like growing roots in the buds, in the stem or in the fruits or storage organ like uh, what we call it, uh, legumes. Okay, uh, right. So itu semua kita panggil sugar, sugar sauce. Right. But uh, it may be other, this uh, sugar sauce can be sugar sink or sugar sink can be sugar sauce in different season, right? Okay, so uh, storage organ may be either a sugar sauce or sugar sink depending on season. You might be having different season. So in summer, for example, and also during uh, fall or spring ke, or autumn, ke, kan? right? So the sugar sauce and sugar sink will be different. Okay, but we use the normal sugar sauce, right, in summer, which is sugar sauce is the leaf and sugar sink might be the roots or um, fruits or legumes. Uh, so that is the sugar sink. Okay. All right. So now, so sekarang ni kita bayangkan kita punya uh, sugar sauce. Sugar sauce is leaves. Okay. And our sugar sink is root or uh, legumes. Okay. So this is our uh, example that we are going to use. Okay. Now let's go to the mass flow hypothesis or pressure flow hypothesis, the mechanism of translocation in angiosperm, right? Okay, so phloem loading. Sucrose is manufactured in the mesophyll cell of leaves, right? Sucrose manufactured in the mesophyll cell can travel to the sieve tube element via simplast. Simplast, or we call it as the simplastic root. Remember back what is simplastic root? Right, simplastic root is the root of mineral that um, crossing minimum of one plasma membrane and it travel along the continuum of the uh, cytosol, right? Uh, and then going from one cell to another cell via plasmodes mata. Okay, right. In some species, sucrose exit simplast near the sieve tube and then travel along apoplast. Okay, it is then actively accumulated from the apoplast by the sieve tube element and their companion cell. Right? Okay, so to understand this, let's look at this picture. Okay, so this is mesophyll cell of the leaf. Okay, so sugar is manufactured here. So this is your source of sugar. Okay, this is sugar. Right? Sugar is transported from uh, using same plastic root 
Okay, you can see here, this is seam plastic root. Right? So sugar is transported from one cell to another mesophyll cell via plasmodes mata, and then going to another cell bundle sheath. So from the bundle sheath, then it goes to the, it exit the same plastic root and then enters the apoplastic root. Okay, so this is our sieve tube member. Okay, so this is our sieve tube cell. And this is the companion cell. All right, so the sugar exit the same plastic root and enter apoplastic root. All right, so next is um, sugar movement into the phloem requires active transport because sucrose is more concentrated in the sieve tube element and companion cell than mesophyll cell. Okay, what does it mean? So it means that sugar uh, transported into the phloem by active transport. All right, so here in the sieve tube, you have a very high concentration of sugar. Okay, so here in the apoplastic pathway, you have low concentration of sugar. So that is why sugar from the apoplastic pathway in the uh, sieve tube cell, right, uh, need to be using active transport to be uh, transported into the um, what we call it, into the sieve tube member. Okay, all right. So we have, we are going to transport the sugar from here into the sieve tube member that have a very high concentration of sucrose. Okay, so this assistance, ataupun how this uh, sugar can be uh, transported into the sieve tube is by the help of proton pump. Okay, so I'm not going to detail out, but it's just want to share with you okay, what happened actually. So this is the enlarged image of the uh, membrane. Okay, and this is the extracellular space of the cell wall, right? So proton pump actually help to pump hydrogen ion actively from low concentration in the cytosol to high concentration at the extracellular space of the cell wall. Okay. So then, as we learn in bio one, so the accumulation of hydrogen ion in the extracellular space will create a proton gradient. So this proton gradient, right, uh, can actually help to transport sucrose together into the uh, cytosol or into the sieve tube member by using co-transporter, right? So sugar from here low concentration can be transported into the cytosol or into the sieve tube cell that have high concentration together with the hydrogen ion. So hydrogen ion here from high concentration to low concentration. So this is what I call as co-transporter. So the proton gradient help together to transport sucrose from the extracellular space, which have low concentration of sucrose into the uh, sieve tube member that have high concentration of sucrose. Okay, right. So now we have accumulation of sugar in the sieve tube or in the flow, in the follow -on. Okay, so next one is, let's see the mechanism, full mechanism of the loading of sugar, the loading and unloading of sugar. Okay, so remember back, we have here, this is our source cell, the leaf, and this is our sink cell, which is the root. So sugar will be transported from sugar source to sugar sink, right? So here we have the sieve tube, which is the phloem, right? And then adjacent to it, we have the xylem vessel. Okay, so first thing first, the loading of sugar or sucrose into the sieve tube will reduce the water potential of the sieve tube. Okay, remember, sucrose will be transported into the sieve tube via 
active transport. Okay, uh, so remember, this is what we have learned tadi lah. Right, uh, via active transport. So, okay, so next we have uh, accumulation of sugar here in the sieve tube. So the loading of sugar or sucrose into the sieve tube will reduce the water potential, will lower the water potential of the sieve tube. Okay, next, what happened is to balance the, ataupun to reduce the, water, uh, to increase the water potential inside the sieve tube. So water from the, water will enter the sieve tube from the xylem via osmosis. So here in xylem vessel, it has a very high water potential. So water from the xylem will diffuse into the sieve tube element, okay, via osmosis. Okay, all right. So as uh, uh, the sieve tube takes up water by osmosis from the xylem, and this will create positive pressure or hydrostatic pressure generated. Remember, positive pressure means push. So you just imagine you have uh, what you call it, flow worm, and this is xylem. All right. So your flow worm has a low water potential. So water from the xylem will diffuse by osmosis into the flow worm. Just imagine what happened. Your flow worm set will be pushed down. So this is this pushed. A uh, set of flow is due to the generation of positive pressure. So the positive pressure or hydrostatic pressure will be generated, which will force the flow worm set to be flow along the flow worm from region of high water potential, sorry, from region of high pressure to region of low pressure because we are not talking about pressure. So the, the, the what you call it? Sing, sorry, the source have high pressure and the sink cell have low pressure. So the flow set will be forced to flow from the uh, region of high pressure in the sugar source to the low pressure in the sugar sink. Uh, so your set will be flow set. Remember what is flow set, right? Component in the flow, which include the sugar, uh, ions, and other solids. Okay, so it will be flow down to the sugar sink. Okay, next, what happened? Okay, next, as the sap reach to the sugar sink, the unloading of sugar into the sugar sink will be happen followed by water. So the unloading of sugar can be either by passive transport or active transport into the sugar sink. Uh, so sucrose or sugar will be uh, unload, okay, into the sugar sink either actively or passively, all right, and followed by water, okay. So hence, sugar sink will always have low pressure compared to sugar sauce. So the unload sugar in the, at the sugar sink can be used for respiration. It can be used for growth and metabolism, or it can be converted into insoluble starch at the sink for B, uh, to be storage. Okay, or to be stored in legumes, for example, right? Or to be stored in the root, for example. Okay, right. And then what happened to the water? Remember, the water flows together with the sap down to the sugar sink. Okay, some water from the flow worm diffuse back to the xylem and recycled back to the source. So water from the xylem, okay, will be diffused back. Sorry. Water from the flow worm or at sugar sink will be recycled back or diffused back into the xylem back to the sugar source and the cycle will continue. Okay, All right. Okay, so look at this video. Vascular plants produce nutrients such as sucrose in their leaves. These nutrients must then be transported to the rest of the shoot or to the root tips where growth occurs. The leaves are referred to as the source, and the shoot and root tips are referred to as the sink. A source is an organ that produces more sugars than it requires, and a sink is an organ that consumes sugars for its own growth and storage. There are two kinds of vascular conducting tissues in plants. Xylem, which conducts water and dissolved minerals, and phloem, which conducts carbohydrates, mainly sucrose. 
The transport of sugars throughout the plant, called translocation, is carried out by phloem cells. Phloem cells are connected to one another end-to-end -end by sieve plates. These are perforated structures that create a direct connection between the cytoplasm of connected phloem cells. Phloem loading is the process whereby carbohydrates enter the sieve tubes at the source. As a result of phloem loading, a high concentration of sugar develops in phloem cells near the source. Phloem loading results in a lowered water potential compared with adjacent xylem cells causing water to move from xylem to phloem by osmosis. This influx of water creates a high turgor pressure near the source and lower turgor pressure near the sink, causing the movement of water and sugar from the source to the sink. Sucrose is removed at the sink by various active transport mechanisms depending on the cell type. In some plant cells, a transport protein located in the membrane of a storage vacuole called a tonoplast transports sucrose from the sink cell cytoplasm into the vacuole at the expense of ATP. This reduces the concentration of sucrose in the sink cell, which enhances the movement of sucrose from the phloem cells through the companion cells and into the sink cell. All these events produce a continuous flow of water from xylem to phloem and then back to xylem. Water leaving phloem in the root moves upward primarily due to transpiration, not due to water potential differences between xylem and phloem. Okay, right. So then you, you can understand from this explanation, some water from the phloem at sink diffuse back into the xylem. That is mainly due to the transpirational pool. All right. Uh, so then the process will be recycled. Recycle. Okay, right. Okay, so that is all about chapter three. Okay, so Ibn Anafis, for your information, was the first person to record the coronary circulation, which is, he is the one that who recorded the vessels that supply the blood to the heart, okay, uh, as our additional information for today. Okay, with that, we end uh, with chapter three, and that's all. See you in the, ne in the next class. Assalamualaikum.